Um, thank you, Andre, for coming to the talk. Um, so Andre is, uh, is a researcher at EPFL and he got his PhD a few years ago. So he's been working there on high level synthesis. Uh, there is some work here on actors that I was very interested to, to see. So I'm happy to, to have you here. So go ahead. Okay, thank you, Jose. So um, today I'm going to talk about uh, a tool that uh, we are developing at uh, IDPFL. It's called uh, Streamblocks and it's uh, a compiler for uh, data for applications and we target heterogeneous uh, platforms. So, uh, so uh, heterogeneous platforms, they come in, uh, in many different forms. Uh, we can see them as a small embedded device or very large embedded device like uh, this DNA sequencer here. It has different processing elements inside. You can have like a CPU or you can have GPUs. Then um, you can have a, a cluster of, of computers that can contain both the CPUs and FPGAs, or you can also have like system, system on chip devices like the Zinc for uh, autonomous driving. So the, the question is how, how do you program such um, heterogeneous platforms? And uh, from the system, system designer point of view, it starts with the behavioral description. So describing what the application is going to do, right? And then you start with this uh, analysis of uh, uh, saying which, which part of this application should uh, run in software, which part should run in hardware. And once I had decided which, which thing goes where, uh, is there a consequence uh, for this initial partitioning? And then it starts with the part of you port the code from software to hard, the software or hardware, and you can use different programming languages like C or C++ or Java for, uh, for the software part, and very low VHDL, blue spec, and now lately we are using a lot of high-level synthesis for, for doing hardware. And from the software side, uh, we need to decide the number of threads, the number of cores, uh, are we going to vectorize already the code or we are going to let that to the compiler? Are we going to use any existing libraries available to our problem? And um, from the hardware side, what, what is the level of parallelism that we are going to, to have? Uh, do, are we going to use different long domains? Are we going to use, as in software, um, existing IP cores? And then how do I interconnect actually the hardware and the software part? So what interface I'm going to use is, is my accelerator in a PCI Express, it's running on an Axidas, or it's either through, through, the, through the internet, for example, and if this bandwidth is enough. Um, another step on it is uh, how do you consumulate such an heterogeneous design and what is, what is going to be, how do you estimate the performance of the overall system? And uh, a, very, a very important question in, uh, in that part is, how do you extract the profiling information of every individual part of that heterogeneous system? And then can you use uh, an external tool for doing uh, design space exploration for, uh, for that target? And if you can, great. So it means that you are going to have like different iteration loops up until you optimize your design and or you do it manually. And then you have your system, uh, your system implemented after a lot of iteration loops. So, um, so what can be kind of an ideal flow, let's say, for, uh, for heterogeneous platforms? First is to probably use um, a single, um, single description, so like a single programming language for, for, both, for both parts, to support legacy code, which is very important for the industry, to do, a, because you, you can have the same language, you can do like seamless hardware and software partition out of have uh, a different choices of, uh, of interfaces so that you can use for, uh, for your intelligence platform to provide fine grade profiling and also have the design space exploration. So this is actually kind of what, uh, what um, I and a student of mine, we are working on, uh, on the stream blocks. So um, now deciding on, uh, on what language should be, on what language we should use for that. Um, Mostly in the industry right now, they are using C and C++ languages, basically. And 
this um, this this languages has um, has a model of computation which is imperative. So you need to do steps one by one. Of course, you can uh, if you want to do like. Um, Parallelism, then you can have like different threads and you're going to use multiple cores, but those are like libraries. It's nowadays that we can see actually on the languages that we, they provide parallelism out of it. So um, there are some serious issues with using uh, C and C like uh, languages for intelligence platforms. First, still, um, they are sequential by concept. And tools, even though uh, they are getting um, highly optimized, especially GCC and LVM, they cannot expose for you automatically the parallelism out of your code. And um, there are some language limitations, especially for tools such as high-level synthesis, that to, to extend the sequentiality with um, concurrency structures, then they are going to give either extension on that language uh, or provide um, non-standardized non constructs, a lot of pragmas, uh, use proprietary libraries. And by doing so, uh, they lock the developer only on a specific tool and not on, on a specific platform. Right? Um, so uh, another, uh, yeah, so uh, C++17 and uh, this new Chrono SQL, it comes uh, partially those limitations, right? But still, uh, the idea of using C and C in C++ languages, still you have this sequential concept in mind. Um, another model of computation is data flow. So uh, with data flow, you split the computation across actors. And in that, in that way, you provide an explicit concurrency of your application. Um, in, uh, in data flow, the communication happens only by point-to-point -point connections, the, which are lossless. And uh, for some model of, of computations, some data flow model of computations, they are conceptually unbounded. But when we implement them, we are not really about it. We, we size them. Um, and we call tokens the data that pass through those actors. There are uh, different flavors of um, data flow. You can have CAN process networks, um, which are more like dynamic processes that they run concurrently. You have static models like uh, synchronous and cyclostatic data flow models. You have more dynamic uh, models like uh, data flow process network and the one that we are using which is um, which is like on top of uh, dpn it's called data flow with firing um, so on uh, my presentation is going to have the, the following parts and first i'm going to describe the cal data flow program language that we are using how do we take that language and we transform it to our intermediate presentation called an actor machine and from this actor machine, how we are going to generate hardware and software codes. Uh, and if we, if we have time in the end, I'm going to talk a little bit about design space exploration and the tool, how to integrate this tool called Tunus with, uh, with Streamlabs. And I'm going to conclude the talk. So, yeah. So uh, let, let's have like a very fast crash course on Cal. So um, with Cal, we can describe actors. And uh, an actor has a name, like here, add, and it has two input ports here, A and B, and an output port X. So the computation in the actors in Cal happens inside actions. And here we have an action that will read a token from port A, a token from port B, and will do an addition on port X. So we call port A and B input patterns, and the output we call them um, what happens inside the output, we call that output expressions. Um, an actor can have state, so we can have state variables inside actors. We can define multiple actions inside the actor. Uh, we can guard the execution of an, of an actor. So for example, here, uh, we select one of those two defined actions depending uh, on the value of that token. So for example, the first action to be activated, it needs uh, a needs to be uh, greater or equal to zero. Um, then we can define priorities on uh, on those actions. So, for example, in uh, in this B as merged, what happens is that if at the same time you have tokens on port A and B, first you execute copy A and then you execute copy B. Um, 
you can define explicitly uh, a state machine on how do you want to execute those actions. So for example, here you do post net, post net, post net from time. And uh, also um, we, we provide a mechanism for describing processes. So like, I have uh, a quick question. Yes. So here with the guards, it looks like you can pick at the value and exactly. decide which exactly. one to yes. do a fire. So if you yeah. do that, then the determinist is can be broken. So, so that's okay. We do something similar, but it's just to not understand the semantics. So, so for example, um, let's say like the, the the point three, for example, the multiple action. This is a completely non-terministic act. Okay. So you you can describe non-terminism in Cal if you want. It's not great, right? I mean, uh, it's not great for implementing it, but you can still do it. Um, uh, the point uh, four, so the example four, actually this is a pretty deterministic as as it is, because um, you know, the um, the conditions that you have, I mean, they are they are fulfilled, right? I mean, like the one is greater or equal to zero, and one is it's a negative number, so you don't have many choices on what you can execute next. Um, the the five. It's it's also deterministic, um, and uh, and seven it depends. So uh, if you don't have something that will analyze, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that later on, uh, you you don't know actually if it's deterministic or not deterministic but, but at the beginning four, of just looking the code, right? Okay, but on four you were looking at two different ports. You can decide which one to pick based on the value. So uh, it's uh, it's one port, right? There, right? So, about two different values. I it's guess two different values, yes. Yeah. So you will see later a little bit on what we do with factor machines, and uh, I think it, this question can be a little bit clearer afterwards. Continue. Um, so um, the ports can uh, can have types, and uh, so here you can have like integers, like for input and output. Uh, the language by itself can provide uh, different native types like integer, assign integers, floating point, double precision, string list and maps, and other sets. Uh, we can parameterize the integer types. So we can say if we type int size equal four, it means that we are going to define an integer of four bits. Um, also, the user can define what we call a product type, which is like a like, like a structure, so here for example type p, it's a it's a product of a, of an integer and a floating point, but also we can define also some types. And uh, here uh, type s is a combination of two types a and b, in which a is an integer and b it's uh, it's a floating point. So sometimes are really interesting because you can do pattern matching basically inside uh, the action code. Um, so how do how do you describe the, a network of factors in Kerala? So let's say that uh, we want to create a, a sum actor, which is going to be composed by uh, uh, two actors. So the first one is just um, it sends the value zero in the beginning, and then it's just a pass through, like this one. So for example, as I said before, you take the value from this parameter v. You send on the output, and then you execute all the time uh, action B. So you send, it's like an identity app. Um, and then you have an additional actor. So to describe this uh, connectivity that we see on the right top of the screen, we can do it like that. So we define the network, and that network has a name sum. It has the inputs and the outputs as the actors. But inside of it, we can define the entities that we are going to use. So for example, the line add equal add uh, parenthesis is add is, a, add is an instance and add with a capital A, it's the entity, the actor. And the, the entity can also be an actor or a network also. And the structure will define uh, the connectivity between the ports. So for example, like uh, in minus minus greater indicates that you have the input port and you connect it to the input port of add add dot a. Um, then 
for example, if you want to describe like a Fibonacci, we can use the same actors that we defined previously, like that. Uh, we can still scale it, so we can add as many as we want. And also, uh, let's say that if we wanted to parameterize it, like I said, like I want to have like a, a very big Fibonacci uh, network of actors. So we can do it like that. So uh, here we should see the, the entities as, let's say, expressions and the structures as statements. So um, the first line on the entities, it's a, it's a comprehension, which it tells that depending on parameter n, it will create uh, n minus two instances of the adductor. And for the z, it's going to create n minus one instances of the z adductor. And we can, on the structure side, if we have defined them with uh, comprehensions, like in, uh, in the entities, we can have the index of, and the index will tell which, uh, which actor I'm going to use on my list of actors. And then we can uh, have like uh, four loops inside of it. And then we can also have like if, so we can really make um, parametric network structures directly from the, from the language. Um, so now, some uh, uh, I, I want to just describe the two properties of uh, of data flow with firing. So some actors in uh, in this model uh, can be, can be defined by the input prefix that they are going to act on, and the firing function which maps the the input prefix into um, the output sequence in that case. So so here, for example. Um, the, the input prefix is going to be given by the, the two ports. And then we have this addition happening. And here the input prefix is the same port, but we take two elements from that, uh, from that uh, input. So um, with some conditions on the input prefix and the firing function, uh, this actor, they compute a streaming function. And by, by function, it means that uh, those actors are deterministic. And it doesn't matter actually how you're going to schedule them, they are still going to be deterministic at the, at the end. Um, another important property of uh, data defining is the prefix monotonicity, so, which means that as, as much data as it gives, uh, as you give it at the input, it will produce a lot of data at the output. And if we take this uh, bias mode example uh, with the priority between uh, the, the actions, let's say that we don't have an input at the, at the first input, but we have a data on the second input. It's going to generate a two, as we see here. But if you give it, if you have data on the two inputs, it will give one and two. So, um, Non-prefix monotonic actors are what we call time-dependent actors. So, uh, which means that the execution will depend on how the data arrives uh, onto the actor. And as an example, here we just give on the first uh, input the value, we have one. And if we have at the same time values like one and two, we don't know if the value is going to be one or three because it depends how they are going to arrive. Which which one of first of the data is going to arrive? Um, so how how the the actors are being enabled for for execution? So first, um, all the input patterns. So the input patterns here are the how many data we'll have on, on our inputs. I, they need to be satisfied. So for example, here we need to have data on A and B. Uh, the guard uh, expressions, they should be true. And you shouldn't have like a higher uh, priority action enabled before you enable this action. Um, and we call uh, a step of an actor once an action has been selected and then this action is being executed and then you go back to an action selection. So this is the kind of the, the execution model. So you select an action and then you execute, you execute what happens inside and then you go back to selecting another action. Um, so if we have uh, a cow network, 
like uh, this example here with ABC actors. Uh, one uh, possible way of, let's say, implementing that um, software can be represented uh, as, as following. So you can have like a, a while, infinite, and then you call this step function for, um, for every actor, like, like a round robin scheduling, for example. If you have like a, a multi-core system, then you can have like a, a parallel while, so you can execute them on parallel. And inside a step function, you check, uh, you check if an action can be enabled or not. If it can be enabled, you execute this action and then you go out of it. So this is like some um, very basic information on, uh, on CAL and in, uh, how it's executed. And uh, here I'm going to talk about how do we kind of optimize this action selection part by using actor machines. So let's um, let's see about how uh, what is the step uh, function for this uh, for this actor. So first we need to check if uh, we have tokens on port X and on Y, and then if this is true, we are going to write the data to port Z. We write the addition to the port Z. Uh, on this ping pong merge, uh, the step function can be. Um, I'm checking first if I have a data on port X and my guard is true, then if true, then I'm writing the data, I'm updating the state variable, I'm going out. <clears throat> if this is not true, then we go to the other condition. So, um, so what actually happens when, um, when let's say we don't have data on, uh, on, uh, on port Y for quite some time and Another part is um, what what happens if if also here we don't have uh, uh, data on port Y. Uh, what will happen is that every time that you enter inside this step function, you are doing this conceptual conceptual um, checks for uh, for every for every step, and actually you are making a useless useless checks all the time and the the idea is actually how can we uh, remove those checks as much as uh, as possible and um, a model that kind of eliminates those uh, those unnecessary checks uh, it's an actor machine so an actor machine is a it's an abstract machine model that um, is uh, it has a controller and this controller has uh, has a state and every state is going to execute uh, a different set of uh, instructions so uh, a test instruction will take a condition and uh, two states s1 and s2 so if this test condition is true then it goes to s1 otherwise it goes to s2 um, the execute instruction it executes an action and then it goes to state s and uh, the wait instruction, it waits for something to happen exterior to the actor before going to state S. Um, so the, the state on, the, on this controller represents the knowledge of all the conditions in, uh, in this actor machine. And a condition can, can be uh, false, like zero, one, true, or X for a known. And a state can, can have zero or more instructions. Um, so let's let's uh, let's build a, a actor machine for um, for for like this identity pass through pass through actor. Uh, first annotation. So uh, we say that uh, an action it's like a transition in this uh, actor machine, and we name that uh, T zero. Uh, we have condition here, condition zero, which checks for the input. Condition one that checks for the output, and um, lowercase c, uh, 0 and 1, is the value of the two conditions. So, um, so now we have, we have those two conditions. So that means that we have uh, a state with two values. And in the beginning, we start with, uh, with unknown. We don't know, actually, if uh, we have uh, any, any, any input or we have output in our system. 
uh, then we decide to pick one of those conditions. And uh, here we have uh, chosen the, the C0. So if C0 is false, which means that I don't have any data on my input, uh, then I have uh, the following state, zero and unknown, which translates, uh, which will go to, to wait instruction to say that I cannot do anything, so uh, I, I need to wait. And then I'm going back to the to the initial unknown unknown state. But now if, if, if I have the data, that's nice. I go to another condition, C1, which I will check for the output. And if this output is true, I'm going to transition zero, which is the action. I'm executing the action. Once I have executed, now I don't have any more knowledge of what happens on my ports. I need to go back in, the, in the unknown unknown. Uh, if it falls, if it is false, so that means I don't have any space on my output, then, um, then I need to wait. But here, the difference is that I know that I have already read a value from before, right? So I, um, we maintain actually the knowledge of that. And this is, this is a very simplistic example. Um, and uh, on the other side, we can start uh, by also checking uh, C1. So what will happen with C1? So C1 is the output. So if we don't have output, then we go to wait. Um, if we have a space, then we go check C0. If it's true, that means that there is an input, you go to T0. If it's false, then you're still going to wait. So, um, so now we have, we have actually um, terminated the construction of, uh, of the actor machine. And uh, what, what we have here is that all the possible uh, executions that we can do with, uh, with the actor machine and all the possible conditions are represented on the graph. Um, so this is what is called the uh, multiple instruction actor machine. So it means that on every state, we can execute multiple instructions, or we can choose different instructions. And um, uh, a multiple instruction on a machine, it's, uh, it's not possible to be implemented in, uh, in, in, in real software, let's say. And what do we do is uh, we do something that is called reduction. And the reduction is the process of just keeping only one uh, instruction per state. So for example, here we can, um, if we are on the unknown state, we can either choose to keep C0 or C1. Um, if, if we keep from, if you keep C0, then all the parts of the C1 and the other condition is just being eliminated. So there are different ways of, um, of, of reducing an actor machine. Um, and, um, and it can have we can have actually different properties. I mean, as as the actor becomes more and more complicated, probably they are interesting to to see like different strategies on how can we reduce the actor machine to a single one, single instruction one. Um, so uh, why uh, why the actor machine? Uh, so it's uh, it's more of it's a formal model of uh, of executing data flow actors, and we keep the knowledge of the tested conditions. So we don't need to test again and again conditions that we have already tested. And this is, this is very important, especially for software implementation. Um, as a model, uh, it can serve for analyzing like different, um, different data flow models computations, but also we can use it for um, telling us if, um, if an actor is uh, deterministic, if it's non-prefix monotonic also. Yeah, and I have a question yes. about the yes. actor, the thing that you say on the testing. You say yes. that if what you have tested an actor, you don't have to test it again. Uh, yes. But so, but many of the bugs are integration tests, so it's the interaction across actors. You are still going to have to do the interaction testing, no? Um, no, actually, here what happens is that uh, uh, let's say that I'm I'm here, right? I mean, this is like kind of what an actor machine I'm going to do now. If I'm on the state one uh, x. I'm still I'm going to still to maintain that uh, that state. So on the next time that I'm that I'm going out of my step and I'm coming back again, I'm going to enter on one x and I'm not going to enter on uh, on x x for example. Right. So you don't need to do checks that you have already done before. For the for the for the actor, yes. But I'm talking about the. When you start to combine actors, they can interact with each other. Um, 
Yeah, yeah, right, right. I mean, like still, but uh, it, it depends how do you how do you implement them. So if you if you implement them on uh, like on this like uh, let's say monocore and you have like a round robin for executing the actors on the software, on still it doesn't matter what the other actors are going to do. Uh, you you have still maintained your own uh, on your own state of where you were before. Okay. No? Uh, I could think more, but yeah, sort of. Yeah, I mean, probably it's going to be a little bit clearer when once we talk about the real implementation of it. Um, so, um, so, 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 yeah, with the actor machine, actually, we can um, we can really analyze the actor of, of itself. So we can get a lot of information of how an actor behaves, and and I think that this is. Um, this is a very important uh, part if you compare it with uh, with C, for example, that you you don't have a you don't have a formal model out of it, and actually you don't know um, what the code is going to execute. Here, at least from the Cal perspective, but also with the actor machine, we can get a lot more information on what things what happens actually in your code. Um, uh, with actor machines, we can uh, we can also do something that's called composition. So the idea is that you take uh, two different actor machines, which normally they are connected side to side, and then you combine them together as a, as a big actor. This is very interesting for uh, optimizing software models. Uh, and uh, I'm, mm, I, I'm, I mean, Streamblocks, uh, the project is using actor machine for, uh, as a same model for generating both hardware and software components. So Streamblocks. Um, so the idea of Streamblocks is to take a data flow program, uh, ideally described in Cal, and out of it we can decide if we want to generate software code out of it and multi-core so, uh, software code out of it, uh, hardware code out of it. So for example, like if you want to have like an IP, you can generate only for hardware, or you can use it for both. So uh, you can combine both. Uh, Multicore and the FPGA together, and uh, Streamblocks is open source, by the way, and uh, it's on some GitHub. Um, so the the flow of uh, of the compiler is the following one: uh, we start with Cal, and we give that to Tycho. So Tycho it's the the compiler that translates Cal to actor machines, and was initially developed in Yale uh, University. Since then, uh, we are co-developing it. IDPFL and Nandund. Um, and once you get the actor machine, you also get a network representation out of how things are being connected. We send it to two different code generators, the hardware generation, the software generation, which will generate um, a multiple files. So for the hardware, we are, we are using high-level synthesis for doing it. Uh, only for the um, for the actor level, not on how things are being interconnected. I will show you later. So we have we have a software runtime that uh, enables uh, multi-core execution. We have also a hardware runtime for. Uh, I will explain that one later on. And we continue we uh, connect uh, those runtimes with what we call a, a partition link. Um, so once those uh, are connected, uh, we can generate an executable that uh, will represent the software part and an XL bin, which is like an OpenCL uh, XL binary file for programming the FPGA. Um, we also have an alternative path, which we can do co-simulation. <coughs> and uh, we can uh, we use the co-simulation not just for verifying uh, the application, but also for uh, doing profiling. And uh, we have a tool for doing uh, the partitioning. And the partitioning generates a file called DCF, which I'm going to describe later, which ex explicitly says uh, which uh, actor goes where, hardware or software. Um, so uh, the compiler is uh, it's, it's a Java-based compiler. And uh, Currently, we target uh, only Xilinx uh, devices for FPGAs. So, um, so the HLS part. 
so the half generation will generate um, C plus plus five for every for every actor. It will generate a bunch of uh, scripts, a lot of scripts for to to launch the the synthesis. It generates um, a very log file for how it's being interconnected, the actors, and how and some and something that we call trigger scheduling. I'm going to explain that on how those actors should be executed. And uh, very low test benches for the for every actor and the network. So um, we fill the the C plus plus and the scripts to evaluate VAD or VTSHLS, and then we generate very low out of it. And then uh, <clears throat> we combine everything together to Vivado to have um, an, uh, a Vivado project file, which will contain everything together. And uh, on it, you can uh, you can create an IP core if you want out of uh, uh, if you want to do just hardware, uh, or you can use it for doing um, uh, simulating individual actors on the network. And the other part is um, we create uh, what we call an auxilinks object, which basically is uh, all the all the very log files that have been generated by string blocks and Vivad HLS are combined together plus an XML file and, um, and uh, an Axel Light driver. So this is combined together on an auxilix object. It's being given to V++ <clears throat> and the V++ is going to generate the binary file that we can program the language in. Um, and all this process is uh, being uh, controlled by Cynic. So we generate Cynic scripts for doing all this uh, for you actually. So you don't need to do anything manually on, uh, you just type CC make the FPGA part that you want, uh, which kind of platform that you want. And then at the end you type make and you have a binary file and the executable. So, um, so why uh, Vivado and not, uh, not, our, not our own? Uh, the, the very quick uh, answer to that is that I developed uh, Nature Less when I was doing my, my thesis and uh, uh, as a single person doing an uh, doing an HLS, still it's uh, it, let's say like it's not fun and you cannot really compare it with industry. Let's say. Um, so uh, still though, without HLS has uh, some uh, very interesting advantages. Uh, so it's it's almost free as a, as a free beer, and uh, people uh, they can they can use it uh, as is directly. Normally you don't need a license for uh, for small. Uh, Embedded boards. Uh, it's a very uh, advanced uh, HLS. Uh, I mean, it can it can really do some great stuff with uh, with the the operator scheduling that they have. So the scheduling under constraint, the CDC algorithm, uh, which is used in the HLS, and it provides you. Uh, with a lot of optimizations that you need to specify though on, onto the code, like pipelining and uh, memory optimization, such as loop timing, polyhedral optimization. So uh, one thing that uh, Vivad HLS is, uh, is actually really bad at is on uh, doing uh, data things. And it has, it has a lot of limitation, even though it provides uh, this kind of a pragma, pragma HLS data flow, and then you can have um, like functions with uh, streaming um, streaming interface, uh, it's it's only good actually at creating pipelines of that. So um, uh, taken from the user guide 902 of uh, Vivad HLS, uh, it has it has like some serious limitations. So for example, um, streams can can be only single producer, single consumer. Uh, you cannot bypass, so for example, like a streaming function. If you are in like in a pipeline, you cannot have feedbacks. And uh, uh, this is this is actually uh, a problem, more a limitation for me than uh, other people that they want to use data flow. But it's it, it doesn't uh, the streaming API. It does not provide any counters uh, on the FIFO queue or even picking, for example. So. Um, so how do we translate this uh, this actor machine to, to HLS? So the, the controller is the top HLS function. 
and uh, the controller is going to execute the IAM instructions. So uh, those instructions are the conditions, so um, which are being inlined on those uh, top function, and it's it's going to do what it needs, like checking inputs, outputs, and uh, reading value from uh, comparing value with data from the input. It updates the state. Uh, the execute part, it's launching an action. So this action is translated to C++ and then uh, it's being also inlined into it. And uh, the wait instruction is just the return of this uh, top HLS action. So um, we will see details uh, after this slide, uh, how really this happens. So let's talk a little bit about the, the, the streaming interface and uh, the control interface of of what the value HLS does. Um, so uh, if you want to, to use um, a streaming interface, you need to call um, HLS stream. So basically, it's a, it's a queue implementation. And uh, you pass by reference the, the inputs and the outputs. So uh, this interface can provide like a blocking and unblocking uh, reads and writes. It has an empty and a full check. Um, so it has it has actually a, a count, but only for uh, for simulation. So, and uh, additionally, um, you have apart from the apart from this uh, like um, FIFO interface with these the outs and the ins, you also have a, uh, control signals like for starting. You need the leave clock and the reset, and uh, you have some additional information from uh, from the function like an idle, if it, if it's idle actually if it's ready or if it has finished the execution. So um, so for uh, can you see my mouse by the way or not? Uh, yes, yeah, you can see now. Okay, 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 okay. Nice. Um, so it has some. Um, so the, the issues for us actually is that uh, when we want to implement the conditions, we don't have uh, uh, the count or a size for uh, for the FIFO, and we don't have the picking support. Um, so uh, for that, we actually generate uh, a custom uh, FIFO implementation, and uh, we have this uh, possibility to give a, a pick count and size. Basically, that's um, what it is, and. So the count is going to be sufficient for the input conditions. The subtraction of the size and count is the output condition, how many space do we have? And the peak is uh, used for uh, data dependent uh, conditions. So the, the peak here, although the, the language um, can do a peak even further, not just the head, but even further, let's say below, um, or in the past, let's say. Uh, here we, uh, in our code generation, we just support the head for the moment. The, uh, we can we can actually support even further uh, picking on, on the past by uh, implementing uh, the FIFO actually as a shift register. So, but this is not implemented yet, on, on the and we don't have really designs that uh, they are using this kind of picking. Um, so. Um, now that we, we have some hardware that, that support that, we need to add this support on the software side. And uh, for, every, uh, for every actor, uh, depending uh, how many inputs and outputs it has, we create a, a structure, which we call IO structure. And it contains uh, the peak count, size, and count. And uh, I'm going to show later how, how, this, uh, how this structure is being used on, on, on the HLS. So, um, so the uh, the HLS code still we start from the cal code. We have an actor machine, and we generate a C plus plus class for implementing uh, the actor. It's not important actually what this actor does. I mean, yet it's just I want to show you like structurally what it looks like to to have it as an information. One um, question. I thought before yeah. you were saying, maybe I misread it, but mm -hmm. you were able to generate very low terrain. Well, everything goes through the C++ and Vivado. Uh, so for the actor side, everything goes from the, 
from the C++, yes. Okay. So we, uh, we don't, so we have, if, uh, so what I did in my thesis actually, we were generating uh, directly very low little bit. Um, so here, I don't think, uh, this is, uh, actually it's a big discussion on uh, if we should use an HLS for doing what we are doing or we should, uh, we should generate the very low cut uh, ourselves. So um, uh, for me, the, the choice of uh, using an HLS over to it, uh, it was in the very beginning when I started this project and uh, it was more like a time constraint than a, than a, than a real decision for actually showing actually what we can do. Um, so, um, so yeah, we can we can talk on the Q and A actually on uh, more on why and how can what can we do better uh, out of it, right? Um, so, uh, but still, it doesn't. Um, I mean, even generating a HLS code out of the actors, I think it's uh, it has its positives and its negatives, and especially if you if you generate the code a little bit intelligently. Um, so, um, so for, for every actor, we have a class. And uh, on that class, we can define the, the state variables, the functions, for example, that can use. Uh, scopes are, um, are like intermediate functions that can uh, pick the values, use the, uh, memorize the pick value in some state variables. Uh, we define conditions as functions as members. Uh, also the transitions, the constructor that will initialize part of those uh, state variables. And uh, uh, the controller is being uh, implemented as uh, the function operator overlooking of, uh, of this class. So um, on this side, uh, the, the HLS top function, so the top that we define on the HLS, is is the instance of that class and uh, we give it by value the structure io so for getting this peak uh, counted size directly and we do a static instantiation of uh, of uh, of the class and we call we call the controller and uh, basically, by uh, by doing so, actually everything that is inside of the controller is being inlined onto this top HLS uh, function. <clears throat> so, uh, so we have uh, we have this uh, controller by our actor, and uh, how how this is being described. So, so we overload the, the function operator. And uh, we define that this should be aligned. And basically, the, this graph representation is just a switch, a switch uh, case with go tos. But with a, with a little bit of, uh, of trick. So, for example, the, all the feedbacks that we have from the wait instructions and the, the, the execution instructions so are represented here as returns. So, uh, we never have uh, feedback loops with our go-tos. So in the end, uh, what uh, the HLS is going to, to let's say, expand with the go-tos is basically like a, like a tree structure of uh, if then else conditions, but never with a, never with a feedback. And here we can uh, we represent like we have like four different exports on, on this example. Um, actually implementing it like that uh, uh, in that way, it's for sure that the minimum latency of uh, of an actor is always going to be one cycle, and one cycle because if something is false on all those conditions, or the one that needs to take, it's always going to return after. Uh, after one clock cycle. Um, so uh, just uh, very quickly, so the scopes are also everything is in mind, right? I mean, 
it has the HLS in mind everywhere. So the scope is for memorizing this uh, peak value that is uh, used uh, in the condition. Uh, so here is actually all these values uh, of the IO filter. So for example, like this condition is being implemented as the size minus the count. And uh, the transition also in mind, uh, it uses non-blocking read and writes because we, on the conditions, we already check if we have any in, uh, if we have any available data on the input or we have space on the output. So um, um, from uh, from the type point of view, uh, if um, by default the compiler will will um, generate uh, 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 standard integers, so it's using uh, SD int. For, uh, for the integers. And uh, we have some conditions that uh, if the size, for example, uh, if we have an integer of size four, then we represent them as a, as a size eight. But if we want to, to have uh, uh, precision integers, there is an option on the compiler. And then instead of using SD int, it's going to use the arbitrary precision integers from Vivad HLS, like uh, represented here which will define exactly how the number of bits that you need. So there is a type system in the compiler, and uh, we do correctly, actually, this uh, bit manipulation. Uh, the sum and product types are uh, being uh, implemented as uh, C++ structures, and uh, we, we don't support the map uh, and set types on, uh, on the HLS. Um, for the list, we translate them as uh, as as arrays. So um, for the network of factor, what we do is we we generate a very log. So we generate a very log out of it, and uh, we generate the interconnection of uh, how everything is, should be interconnected. And uh, for example, here the the inputs are represented like that. Uh, the instances are these two modules. And uh, for every for every line the structure you have you have a queue. Um, so the the queues also can be uh, we can already define a, a pre value of the buffer directly on the on the calcul default. Um, the the parameters of the network are are being propagated at compile time. And and if we have uh, uh, if you have an actor that uh, is being con its output is being connected to two uh, to two input ports, we will generate a finite actor automatically for, uh, for it, and then we interconnect it. So there is no need for manual uh, uh, manual part for just adding a finite, right? I mean, as you will do it on Vivad HLS if you got it by hand. Um, so what about uh, performance element? And uh, this is a this is a kind of interesting uh, graph. So um, the different points, the different colors, represent the HLS uh, clock period that you give it for every individual actor. And, and the results that we see uh, is the after synthesis. So. We go from uh, uh, AM C++, we do it for the HLS, we get the very log, and then we synthesize it. Uh, we synthesize the very log for all these individual points. So um, uh, what we see here is that uh, the HLS will do uh, actually a pretty good job uh, for, uh, for like uh, higher plot periods. Like uh, all, almost uh, for all of them, uh, we have less than five nanoseconds as a result, as a synthesis result. Five nanoseconds will be you. And uh, there are just some cases that uh, for really like really high frequencies, like uh, for example, period with one point six, that uh, happens that you don't achieve uh, the 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 after synthesis clock period. Um, so uh, now, what about the latency? So this is um, here we represent uh, so all these individual points. They are just actors, right? For, from a design, 
and then we, we simulate uh, the execution all of it with uh, with a given input sequence, and we get these latency numbers. So, uh, if we see uh, those two points, uh, we see something kind of like uh, like can be normal. Uh, like for example, like if you have uh, if you have a very uh, a very big let's say um, clock constraint, like here it's thirty dot three, is the one that you will get as the less uh, possible latency out of it, right? And uh, for all the points, the the ones that has the best performance, of course, is the one with uh, with um, with the highest uh, clock period constraint, and that that is normal because the you have less registers that they are going to be added on your scheduling for achieving actually that frequency. Um, so uh, the performance uh, of um, of using our tool with VAD HLS, of course, it depends completely on VAD HLS. I mean, like. Um, it's not uh, so like a bad code, of course, is going to be bad results. And, uh, <clears throat> and Vivad HLS will actually will do as much as it can for, for having a, a hard representation of it. So it also depends on the, on the clock period. So still, we can see variation depending on what clock period you are giving as a constraint. The, the code complexity of uh, of the Cal actors. Um, in Cal, we have something that's called uh, a repeat construct. And that repeat construct, it, it reads a number of tokens before executing something. Um, and that will add more latencies because uh, we, by conception, is that uh, from the FIFO part, is that you need one clock cycle per data. So the GAR complexity. Uh, for example, if you if you have a guard that uh, uh, needs the value from uh, from a memory, then you will have uh, a hit of uh, two clock cycles for doing that access. And then, of course, the number of actions and how big actually those actors are. Um, so um, there is one other uh, one other part like about the H-less latency and uh, the real latency that uh, the tool is going to give you. So uh, we have those uh, two actors. So one is just uh, taking one data and then outputting the data directly on the output. And the other one is reading 64 data and then it outputs those ones uh, to the output. So uh, the question is, uh, which actor is the faster one? And uh, the tool, it's going to, if HLS will tell you that this has a latency of one and the other one has a latency of 64. But uh, in reality, actually, both of them, they have uh, a latency of one because you are producing the data every every clock cycle. With just the difference that for the, for the pass with repeat actor, you still need to wait, you need to have those 64 data before execute. Um, so uh, a little bit uh, a more complicated uh, Cal example. So this is uh, it's a transpose actor of uh, eight by eight matrix. And um, what is what is the latency of uh, of such an actor? Uh, if you go back to uh, to the image that I showed you, this actor has a latency of around one hundred twenty eight clock cycles. And this is actually due that we still need to read the data before doing. Uh, actually this transpose operation uh, and um, we can we can still optimize further this uh, this 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 action actually by providing uh, directives into it and uh, uh, for example we can uh, we have added support for um, for giving code annotations into uh, into cal so for example you can tag this actor and say that pipeline this actor for me and it will uh, it will add this HLS pragma directly for you on to the generated code. Um, so now, how do how do we integrate uh, what we have uh, what we have done with the hardware into what what is being called the accelerator model? So um, so the accelerator model is that uh, you 
think of the hardware as an accelerator and you accelerate basically a function. So you will run different functions into that accelerator. So um, the, the, the typical use case, of course you can do better than what I'm showing here. Um, but the typical use case is that uh, you have some data, you prepare those data, you send it to the, to the, to the memory accelerator. The FPGA is kind of waiting for receiving the data. And once it has all the data, it will execute. In that moment, the CPU waits. And then the data is being transferred uh, from the memory of the FPGA to the CPU. You do something with it, and then you still ask again the accelerator. So um, this, this model um, sees really this kind of uh, dominant part of uh, the CPU as being the dominant and uh, the accelerator being the, the slave. Um, on, uh, and this is kind of the, the current model that are being used, for example, for uh, Xilinx Vitis or even uh, for Intel One API. We see a little bit, uh, a, a little bit different. So we, uh, in our in our philosophy, is that both the CPU and the FPGA they are uh, processing elements, and so we can place different tasks wherever wherever they are. It's still the the CPU that will still control the execution. But um, we want to exploit as more uh, as efficiently as we can the, the CPU side for doing something else instead of just launching the accelerator. So um, for uh, supporting the accelerator in uh, in our tool, um, we need to kind of uh, simulate this uh, return of the of the accelerator part. So you have a function. This you will have return. Basically, the hardware will say that I have it done, and it's being interpreted by the host as the accelerator has finished. So um, the, the real question is, uh, does a data flow application return? And uh, that is uh, probably no, right? I mean, it's uh, everything is active. So normally, a data flow application never returns. Um, but uh, we can detect if uh, if part of it it's idle, and we have a developed technique called uh, trigger scheduling, and we manipulate the the generated actors by that HLS. So with this kind of uh, AP start and AP done signals that uh, uh, we co we control actually the start of uh, of these actors, and. Uh, for example, here we have like an example of uh, the actor zero and actor n. It can be a lot of actors. And um, so, for example, actor n, it's just uh, it's being launched, and every time that it's launched, it's a wait. So, um, but the other actor is executing. So, um, up until everybody is executing, uh, all the other actors that they are still on wait, they are still have another launch. So we are launching them again. So. Um, and we call that uh, asynchronous triggering. So once both of them are on wait, we do a second check, which we call that uh, asynchronous triggering. And then if and only if both of them, all of them, they are on the wait, then we say that that part, so the hardware part, is idle. So it's like it's like simulating a, a return, uh, the return part of the accelerator. So. Uh, so why this? Uh, so why the, is this important, right? So because we don't um, we don't have any uh, any other uh, any other part of saying uh, like I, I have finished. Uh, I don't need to have a specific interface, like for example, the access stream, and then I will give like the last of it and say that this is uh, my last element. I am done. Uh, so every trigger is being connected into an actor, like in this description. It's not so important, it's just as an example. And uh, the for us, the the idleness detection is actually the, the fundamental part for placing different actors in software and hardware. Because having like a, this idleness detection, we can say, even if I take an actor from the software and I put to the hardware, it will work in exactly the same way. And uh, thanks to the actor machine, we can have this information if an actor is waiting or is executing. 
Um, I don't know, uh, was I clear on that part? Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so for the for the software part, um, if we if we implement um, the the actors with a with a single core uh, idea behind it, we can say that all the actors they are running the same thread and uh, they are all sharing the same resources. So, in that uh, particular part is that uh, we still translate the actor machine to C++. Uh, the controller, it's, it's almost it's the same, actually, for both software and hardware. The generated code is a little bit different. And uh, for a single core, we apply a round robin scheduling. Um, so if we have uh, more actors than physical colors, we need to do, uh, we need to do some scheduling. And we can also map it into different cores. So every, every core, will have its own thread, and the thread will contain uh, a round robin scheduler. So, I mean, if you have more cores than the real actors, you can run all of them in parallel. Uh, even though sometimes it doesn't make sense because um, uh, running actors into multiple cores, especially if you have uh, uh, SMT, uh, still you have this penalty of transferring data between, uh, between the cores. Um, so how do we how do we deal with uh, with the multi-core execution? So we have separated the network execution on, on four steps. So what we call the pre-fire, the round robin scheduling, post-fire, and termination detection, something like the idleness detection that uh, I, I spoke about on the hardware part. So first uh, we get how much data. Uh, we can read and write from the different uh, input FIFOs that they are being defined on the different uh, on different cores, and we update uh, the the local FIFO counters of uh, of the um, of the core. Then we make that visible um, to the CPU, and we execute uh, the step function for each actor in a round robin manner. Um, once we have finished, we are going to update uh, the write values. So what we have changed in the, in the FIFO in the FIFOs that this core is touching, and uh, it signals to the other CPUs how many data have been consumed and produced. Um, so if uh, none of the actors have fired, then this thread goes to sleep. And if uh, all the other um, CPU threads are in sleep mode, then we terminate. Otherwise, we make another round. So basically, uh, if we have like n cores, we have n threads of it. This is uh, this how we execute it on, on the software. Um, so um, in the very beginning, I, I talked about this uh, on the on the design. Plan. I, I talked about this uh, XCF file that we can give it to Tycho. And uh, XCF it stands for uh, XML configuration file. And for uh, for this, for example, like given this cal code, we defined the network with uh, with those three actors. We can specify in this in this file where do we want to place the um, the actors. So, uh, for example, on partition zero, uh, it specifically says that you need to use the software code generation, and you have only the the sync actor. And on partition one, use the hardware code generation without particular FPGA, and you need to use those two uh, those two uh, actors on this uh, partition. And then the the FIFO connection can uh, you can we can represent actually the sizes that uh, we want for for those connections. So once this file is being given to to the compiler, it will generate two solutions: one for software and one for the hardware. Um, so for the for the hardware software interface, uh, we we create uh, a virtual actor which we call P-Link for the, for the software side that will handle the communication going and coming from uh, the to the FPGA in, from the FPGA, and the P-Link is using the OpenCL API for uh, launching the the kernel actually. Um, on the FPGA side, 
um, the P link is being represented as a, as an input and output stage. So every input stage will read values from the DDR memory and then uh, translate them into 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 tokens. And the output stage is takes it takes the tokens and stores them into uh, to DDR. So. Um, <clears throat> So yeah, as I said before, the the FPGA part is being uh, it's this uh, Xenix object file, and which basically it's an wrapped RTL kernel with all the actors inside of it. Um, so what is the performance of, uh, of 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 this interface? So um, here we we have taken um, we did test on. Uh, on an Aldo U50, which is a top FPGA card. And it uses PCI Express for the communication. And we did the test. So we did a thousand uh, read and write tests of one megabyte. And um, we we come to, to that part. So we can, most of the time, we have almost three gigabytes per second for uh, the input and also for the output. Um, as a as a communication bond with uh, between the hardware and software. So this, of course, this value will change um, if we have a smaller buffer. Then the the bandwidth also will change. So um, we normally what we do is actually we profile for every for every type and um, and buffer size between the hardware and software. We profile and we have kind of a model on how this uh, interface reacts. And <clears throat> so this is like first profiling information that we do uh, for, uh, for a given platform. Um, then uh, we can do um, hardware software cost simulation. And instead of using the, the OpenCL runtime in this part, uh, we are using systemc. And uh, what do we do is that the, the actors that uh, they are being generated by, by the HLS, we convert them with very little into system C. And the, the P link, so all this, um, the read and writes stays the same. We don't change that part of code. We just have like a hook for changing OpenCL or system C. Um, so what we do with it? It's, uh, so we can use, uh, those system C actors for doing uh, for doing cost simulation, we can test like different partitions, and to see actually if it works, it's going to be slow, right? I mean, for for like a very big designs, it can it can be really slow, but also for for small designs, it can be pretty fast actually. And uh, out of it, we can we can get some uh, profiling information. So again, by uh, by using the actor machine model, because we know actually when uh, an actor machine is being executing or it's waiting, we can kind of observe what happens and get out uh, some information of it. Um, uh, from, uh, from the software perspective, if we want to do profiling out of it, we have, uh, we are using like a real time uh, um, hardware timers between the start and the end of every action for getting how much time it took to execute an action. And uh, basically, once we run this profiling information, we can get a file, an XML file, which will represent how much uh, clock cycles it took for, um, for executing uh, every action inside an app. This is actually how I got to this picture before we describing the latency. So every, all the actors, they were running hardware, and then I got this information by the, by the cost simulation. Um, so um, the last part is the, is the, the partitioning part. So I, I cannot go too much into details on the partitioning, because uh, we haven't published uh, something on it yet. Uh, just, uh, but I can, I can just say that this is like, um, 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 I'll say that uh, we just equalize actually the computation between um, uh, it, we do a lot balancing actually between the hardware and the software part for the partition. 
and uh, the partitioning will get uh, the profiling information. So how much time it takes to execute an actor uh, into software, how much time it takes to execute in, uh, in the hardware by the system C, and also the profiling information that I showed you with, uh, with the graph on the bottom. Once we give this information, we'll do some ILP and we get, uh, we get this XCF file, which will tell the compiler to partition it like that. So uh, uh, we test it, uh, the, the partitioning and actually the compiler in, uh, with a video decoder, decoder case, case added. And uh, this is uh, the, the data flow design of an, of an MPEG 4SP. Uh, so this, uh, the source code, it comes directly from uh, the MPEG standard. So there was one part of, uh, of CAL called RVC CAL for reconfigurable video coding that was standardized by the MPEG committee for describing video decoders. So uh, uh, we have we have different uh, video decoder representations. So one can be is this one, the epic for sp but also like the HVC encoding. Um, so this particular design, it's uh, it's very interesting because it um, it has it can have like static actors, dynamic actors, and also uh, actors that contains uh, like uh, non-terminal actors. And as a video decoder, it's still it's a memory bound application. Um, so this design has uh, 60 actors and it has uh, 100 to 50 interconnecting. Um, so what do we get? Um, so this these two graphs. So first we did the we tested on a, on a multi core machine with uh, uh, with eight cores. It's a it's a Xeon Gold edition, so it's top line of uh, CPU with an Algo U250, and we did also the same taste with an embedded platform uh, with a Zinc UltraScale Plus, the ZCU 106. Uh, just for information, uh, Xilinx they provide the platforms only for some particular devices. So, for example, like for the Z Z ZCU 106, it's up to the developer to create an open seal platform for it. So they, they provide kind of some information on how to do it, but still you need to do it. I mean, it's not given to you for free. Um, so um, on this graph, uh, the cross uh, represents uh, just the, the FPGA. So everything apart from this, uh, the source and the display. So it's like the, the most left and the most uh, right actors. Everything else is being placed on the, uh, on the FPGA. And the triangle, it's a combination between uh, software and FPGA. And the, the X is just software. So uh, for the software part, uh, what we can say is that uh, if we do just only software, by using, of course, multiple cores, we can have almost uh, a linear acceleration. For, uh, for ZCU, it's a little bit more. Uh, trivial than uh, the, the Intel one. Uh, the other part is that um, we can, uh, as, as long as uh, we, we are adding uh, hardware actors into the, I mean, as we're adding actors to the FPGA, we can, we can still see that we can increase the performance a little bit. And then it comes, uh, it comes to a point. So for example, like on, uh, on, uh, on the seventh, if we have like seven cores, that the software is going to win. Uh, and this is kind of, uh, it's kind of unexpected actually. So as much as, uh, as much as uh, processing elements you are giving it to it, and especially the, the frequency that uh, the CPUs runs, still you are going to get like a better solution than just having a mix of them. But uh, even though uh, the best solution in, uh, in our case, is uh, is this one, and uh, finding a manually a partition like that, it's kind of uh, it's it's non-trivial. Like how, uh, so for example, like uh, splitting uh, sp splitting the actors like three and five, and just putting into the hard drive. I mean, for 
uh, me that I know the design, actually I couldn't come with uh, such, a, such a partition. So the, the partition tool gives us some interesting results. Um, uh, I don't know how much uh, I think that I have. Uh, can, I, can I still continue or we? So we are a little bit over time. Yes, uh, I know. You have like a... It's like a three slides, man. It's nothing. Three slides to wrap up. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I'm, I'm going just some, some basic information on design space exploration. So um, uh, with Streamblocks, we integrate uh, another tool called Tunus. And uh, Tunus takes as an input uh, an execution trace graph. And this graph, it's a direct acidic graph with uh, nodes representing uh, the single firing of an action and the edges are the dependencies of this uh, action. So for example, um, reading from an input from an action, it's a dependency. Writing a variable, a state variable uh, from an action, it's still a dependency. Um, so this graph, it's a, it's a post-mortem representation of, uh, of the execution of, of a design given an input sequence. And if we take the profiling information, let's say for, for example, like the hardware profiling information, how much clock cycles it takes to execute an action, we can do a, a critical path analysis on it. So we can measure um, what is the longest path between the source and the sink of, of that design. And we can do different uh, optimizations with it. So for example, like doing the buffering dimension. So this is why I didn't talk at all actually on how, how do we size the buffers is because we use this tool actually to help us uh, size the buffers. And we can do also just pure multiple partition. And it provides uh, some analysis uh, also, which uh, it can give you what is the most critical action um, on your critical path. And uh, the impact analysis is, um, it gives you some information on where to focus uh, your optimizations. Then also it can provide you like a complete performance estimation. So if you give, for example, like a, you can give it the partitioning, you can give the weights on the hardware software, you can simulate how much time actually it takes in total to for your design to execute. Um, so for the buffer size, uh, it can give like the minimum buffer configuration so so that you don't have a deadlock, and uh, also it can give you like a close to optimal. Um, uh, solution on your buffers by just uh, optimizing only the, the buffers that they are in the critical path. So by increasing the size, we diminish the, the critical path in um, And the, the impact analysis, it gives you like, uh, it starts, for example, like it gives you like, tells you four actors. And for those four actors, it, it tells you that if you reduce the, the clock latency uh, like for example, for ten up until one hundred percent, how much, how much, uh, how much we are going to reduce the the overall latency actually of your design. So, for example, here, if we if we if we reduce like around uh, forty eight percent the computational, uh, I mean the, the 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 latency of that actor, then you will get twenty percent increase. So. Basically, you can see it as okay. I have a list of factor, uh, a list of actions that I need to optimize, and how do I benefit out of it? How much I'm gaining in the end if I optimize those those actions? Um, and finally, conclusion. So, on the talking again on this kind of um, I ideal design flow, uh, we come uh, in with. This particular design flow, so based on, on Cal, and we separate the design flow on two parts. The first one is the the code generation part, and the second one is the the profiling part. And what we what we have seen is that uh, Cal can uh, can be used uh, as a as a single representation for doing both computations in software and hardware. It's based on a model that can be easily analyzable compared to to C that you probably don't know actually what's happening uh, in your computation. Streamblocks uh, provides uh, hardware and software code generation. We are using HLS for, for doing the hardware part, uh, but we combine all the different technologies together for, uh, 
for creating uh, for creating a real heterogeneous execution uh, on it. Uh, and we can really do seamless hardware and software partition without actually modifying the source code, which is kind of uh, very important compared to, let's say, uh, other techniques. Uh, we can use, uh, okay, I just very quickly describe actually what tools can do. Tools can do also a lot of other stuff uh, to provide the design space exploration on, on the design. And um, we are thinking as, uh, as, as, uh, as a future work like, uh, we have this interest on uh, MLIR, and uh, we would like uh, to describe the actor machines on MLIR and probably get rid, get rid completely of the of the C++ code generation and replace actually the front end of uh, of Vitis, which now now it's open source, with uh, with our own representation based on MLIR. Uh, so uh, thank you for listening to me. <laughs> I know that I came. Have like more than thirty minutes more. Uh, I, I will just uh, I, I need to still to give some credits to, to some people so like uh, James, which is the head of the lab and the dean of computer science at EPFL. Uh, Mayer Mami, which is the student that I'm uh, PhD student that I'm working on with. He's responsible for the heterogeneous interface and the partition custom blocks. John Yanek, the creator of Cal and uh, personal mentor. Uh, Gustav, he initially created Tycho in Lund, uh, Simone, he did uh, the data flow analysis with Turnus, and uh, Marco Matadelli, my uh, ex PhD advisor, which he was the one responsible for uh, uh, bringing the connection between MPEG and, uh, and CAL. So the, the code is open source, everything is there. If you have uh, any questions, please do not hesitate uh, to contact me, my address below. Great, thank you for the talk. So I'm not so sure if there are some questions. We really went over time because I have a class soon. But one thing that I'm curious is, um, because it's something that I work on, try to be a more incremental fast speed. How much time does it take to do all the steps until you generate like the very lot? I'm not telling you when you do the place on route at the PGA, does it generate? And what is the Generated. main? Ah, oh, for, uh, I mean, Third, the very log from the Viva HLS part, or just the no, no, the... from you have your input language and it goes ah, to uh, other, it keeps uh, going. It's seconds. <laughs> so it's, okay, so it's, it's very seconds. fast. Yeah, it's very fast. Yeah, so uh, that is it's not the issue. I mean, the issue comes when, uh, so for example, like if I want to do co simulation, uh, also that one is pretty fast. I mean, for uh, for this video decoder design in. Um, Half an hour, let's say, uh, no, half an hour is too much. Actually. Like 15 minutes, you can you can get an executable out of it, and then you can launch a simulation. The simulation will take quite some time because it depends how much images you want to decode. But uh, and uh, and then, then another question that it maybe it's more conceptual. You keep saying to have co simulation. Yes. But you start with the same source, so the same model will run in the very log generated or the C plus yeah. plus. So why do you need to co simulate? Uh, that's more actually for verification, actually. So to verify that uh, it, it was more, I mean, for me, it's more like a debugging tool that I can see if, uh, if I have not generated something correctly. But uh, so we, we are still- so To on, debug your compiler infrastructure. If not that, 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 that's the first case, but you can actually do something even more on it. So for example, we can do like a deadlock detection. I mean, this is, this is something that we, we want to work on. And uh, because you can have some, differences between on how do you have configured your buffers and uh, it's still you can get kind of this this information out of it actually where you you deadlocked this kind of uh, i think it's very difficult for um, when you design a data flow application to really understand uh, when when your dead, deadlock came from so it can be for example for a guard it can be uh, the buffers right so uh, the the culpit also can come with time, so you can have a time dependent actor, and also you would like actually kind of to trace where you have gotten that. Of course, um, um, so the time dependent actors will also have an, uh, an impact on on um, on the latency. So if you have like a, on the software, you are not going to see this kind of execution latency happen. But uh, if you combine them together, you can have like a time dependent actor that can run some hardware, which is really fast. And probably you can have some deadlocking happen. So this is like, um, 
why cost simulation can be uh, can be an interesting part. Right? I, I can I cannot hear. You. Okay, no, I was saying I'm gonna stop the video and say thank okay. you. Okay, so I see the recording.